adapted and mixed in stereo. Listening through an environment such as stereo speakers or headphones will ensure you get the best experience. Let me quickly tell you about our official podcast sponsor, CDS Print and Design. CDS is a family-run company who offer great prices and great products, such as printed t-shirts, hoodies, canvases, coasters, placemats, stickers, banners, signage, and much, much more. For more information or for a free no-obligation quote, email Colin or Debbie at cdsprintanddesign at gmail.com. You can also find CDS Print and Design on Facebook and Instagram. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that the Haunted UK podcast is now on coffee. If you love the show and want more content, such as bite-sized bonus episodes, horror and paranormal movie reviews, chances to get your hands on exclusive Haunted UK podcast merchandise courtesy of CDS Print and Design as well as a free Haunted UK podcast sticker and much more, then get yourself over to Coffee and sign up to donate just £3 per month. That's K-O hyphen F-I and search for the Haunted UK podcast. Coffee. Why not buy us one? This is Season 2 of the Haunted UK podcast. In this season... We're going to cast our net far and wide to tell stories of UFOs, unsolved mysteries, strange creatures, unexplained disappearances, as well as further tales of ghosts, poltergeists and haunted locations. But before we dive in, why not make a note to listen to the following great podcast. Persons Unknown is a true crime podcast dedicated to unsolved murders and disappearances. My name is John. I'm based in Wales and cover cases from Wales, the rest of the UK and the wider world. Each episode tells the story of a cold case from the original timeline right through to recent developments. The content is based on thorough research and all the evidence is presented in a clear and engaging way. There's no banter but a respectful narration of what happened and any theories. A new episode is released every other Monday, with occasional bonus episodes. There are already plenty of episodes to binge. Find Persons Unknown wherever you listen to podcasts. Before we carry on, I'd just like to give a shout out to Tom McDonald, who's our latest donator on coffee. Thanks so much, Tom, for the donation, and keep listening to the show. I spoke to the previous skipper of the trawler, and he confirmed to me that owning that boat was the worst 18 months of his life. He swore to me that he had seen an apparition near the prow of the vessel. The skipper and his crew seemed completely down-to-earth men who were genuinely scared, and it was then that I concluded that this was a real haunting. The Reverend Tom Willis, speaking about his time with the crew of the trawler, the Pickering. This is episode 15 of the Haunted UK podcast, and in this episode, we're going to go aboard the haunted trawler called the Pickering. (laughs) 
Haunted locations come in many different shapes and sizes, from hospitals, abandoned factories and schools, to mansions, castles and everyday houses on everyday streets. But what about a haunted trawler? Life at sea for the crews of fishing vessels can be an extremely hard and tough existence, and the sea holds many superstitions for many sailors. The Pickering was a trawler with an incredibly disturbing history. For years, skippers and crew would encounter terrifying ghostly apparitions, as well as unexplained electrical disturbances, oppressive atmospheres, and even poltergeist activity. We pick up the story of the haunting of the Pickering when the Reverend Tom Willis, who was the official exorcist to the Archbishop of York, was contacted by Mick Laws, the desperate skipper of a fishing trawler. According to Mick, he and his crew had had nothing but trouble with the trawler since they took ownership of it. It would begin with strange atmospheres which the crew members felt would envelope the vessel whenever they would leave to go out to sea. This dark atmosphere would exert its influence in many ways. Disturbing dreams would frequently trouble crewmen, right up to the point where they would begin to hate the idea of getting rest. The feeling of being watched was another spine-tingling emotion which affected everyone on board at some point in time. It also didn't seem to be limited to just one area of the trawler. Whether you were down in the fish storage, or up on deck, or down in the living quarters, that same cold, hair-raising feeling of being watched would follow you. Other strange things began happening to Mick and his crew. Whilst sitting down in the living quarters one evening, all crewmen were tucking into a meal and chatting about the day's events, when one particular crew member happened to look up at a port or window. Looking back at him was a pale face. The crewman immediately shouted out that there was someone on deck. Everyone went up top and searched the boat but found nothing. They were alone, miles out at sea, and there was something on board with them. Cold spots on the bridge began to plague the crew. No matter how hot the heating was turned up, the cabin would remain cold. Electrical and mechanical issues also began to cause havoc on the boat. The radar and autopilot systems would constantly malfunction, causing the crew to have to head back to land to seek out professional help from specialists. Chris Clark was one such electrical specialist who looked after many fishing trawlers in the Bridlington area where the Pickering was based. He was often called out to solve problems, but the Pickering proved to have issues which were completely bewildering. On one occasion, an error on the autopilot system was causing the boat to go to port when it should have turned to starboard. Chris felt that this was an easy issue to solve by swapping over the two terminals which controlled these functions. For a few hours, while they were still out at sea testing, all seemed to be fine. Then something truly strange happened. The Pickering began to repeat the same error again. Chris went back to the autopilot system to check the terminals, and they were exactly as he'd left them. But after checking them with a meter, he was astounded to find that they had reversed their polarity. This definitely shouldn't happen, as it is technically against our current laws of physics. It was completely perplexing. Chris Clark was also another person who noticed the strange icy coldness of the bridge cabin. Crew members would comment that it was warmer down in the fish storage room with eight tons of ice than it was up in the bridge cabin. Things were now starting to get much worse, with actual physical phenomenon beginning to manifest itself. One evening, skipper Mick Laws was in his bunk trying to get some rest when a disturbing incident happened to him. As he turned on his side to get comfortable, he heard footsteps and then saw and heard the mattress in the bunk directly above him move and bend, as if one of the crew had also decided to try and get some sleep. As he lay there, he began to hear strange whispering that seemed to come from everywhere. Then the mattress moved again. By this time, Mick had had enough, 
so got out of his bunk, stood up and pulled the curtain away from the bunk above, only to find the bunk completely empty. He swore that he had heard footsteps and then the effects of a person laying down on the mattress above him. He quickly gathered himself and made his way up to the living quarters where all crew members were sitting and talking. He questioned if any of them had made their way down to the bunks to get some sleep, but every single one of the crew members swore that they hadn't left the living quarters. The last straw came not long after. Late one evening, while the rest of the crew were down in the living quarters, Barry Mason was taking his turn up top on watch. As he sat in the bridge cabin, he became aware of a figure at the front of the boat. The weather was quite bad at the time. Not rough seas, but heavy rain, so it was more unusual for one of the crew to be out on deck alone. The figure was wearing standard yellow waterproofs with the hood up covering its head. Barry shouted out the name of one of the crew members as he left the cabin and began to approach the figure, hoping that it was at least one of them. The figure didn't react. It just stayed at the front of the boat with its back to Barry. He shouted another name, and then the figure slowly turned around to face him. Barry was frozen to the spot where he was standing. There was no head inside the hood, just a black void. Whatever or whoever this apparition was, it then dissolved and disappeared right in front of Barry. Sheer terror gripped Barry, and he immediately ran down to the living quarters and burst through the door, insisting that he had seen someone out on deck. The whole crew searched the boat for any trace of the stranger, but found nothing. Mick Laws and his crew felt that whatever sinister force had a hold of the Pickering, it was intent on ruining everything that they had worked for. Major mechanical problems then began plaguing the Pickering, completely stopping it from going out to sea. Mick Laws and his crew had finally ran out of money, so had to try their luck at the local job centre. It was here that a job centre employee suggested that Mick get in touch with the Reverend Tom Willis, who may be able to help. After a particularly pleading and desperate phone conversation, Tom Willis agreed to meet Mick Laws and his crew at the docks. Tom listened in detail to the stories of the troubles which had befallen Mick and his crew. He suggested that he perform an exorcism to try and cleanse the boat and bring peace to whatever was causing all of the problems. The Pickering was taken out to sea, so as not to arouse any suspicion, and Reverend Tom Willis blessed every room and every section of the deck. After the exorcism was complete, Mick Laws and his crew felt that the Pickering was a different vessel entirely. There was no longer a dark atmosphere, electrical and mechanical issues seemed to disappear, and the Pickering became a solid and successful fishing trawler that was bringing in a good profit for its skipper and crew. But it was time for them to move on. Before we continue, here's a message from another great podcast. Scotland's history is ghoulish, ghastly, and at times downright gruesome. Who wouldn't want to hear more about it? If you're interested in learning more about Scotland's history, legends, and ghost stories, then the Generally Spooky podcast is for you. My name is Ailey, researcher, storyteller, and believer in ghosts. And my name is Kieran. I'm chief listener, provider of jokes and Ailey's husband, and we are the co-hosts of the Generally Spooky podcast. Join us as we discuss things like the Loch Ness Monster, the Mackenzie Poltergeist, the Battle of Culloden, and so much more. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. You can also find us for free on YouTube and over at our website, generallyspooky.com. We'll see you there. See you there. Now, it's back to the show. John Hilton was the next in line to buy the Pickering and become its new skipper. Along with a new captain also came a new crew. Local villagers would warn John that there had always been something wrong with the trawler for as long as it had been part of the landscape around Bridlington. And they were convinced that the exorcism had only really papered over the cracks. During his time preparing for the exorcism with the previous skipper Mick Laws, 
The Reverend Tom Willis had researched the history of the Pickering and had found out that the boat was originally from Ireland. It was owned by a family but run by the father and his two sons. On one particular trip, during especially bad weather, both sons were washed overboard, with only one of them being saved. The other drowned at sea and his body was never found. The Reverend Tom Willis felt that it was this individual who had been causing the problems all along. This spirit was still aboard the Pickering, maybe still wandering the deck and interfering with the electrical and mechanical equipment, appearing as an apparitional form and generally wanting to be noticed and helped. But the Reverend's exorcism had put the spirit to rest, hadn't it? New skipper John Hilton and his crew wouldn't agree. According to John, as soon as the crew got on board the Pickering, they already felt that there was a dark atmosphere that would envelope the whole boat. Even performing standard tasks and maintenance, crew members would feel uncomfortable, as if being watched, seeing shadows and hearing noises when no other crew members were around. Skipper John Hilton recalls that one of the first major paranormal experiences happened late one night whilst they were travelling between one fishing site to another. He and his crew were down below in the living quarters getting some rest, leaving one crew member on the bridge manning the controls and keeping watch. As the crew member sat in the bridge cabin, the Pickering was powering along under autopilot to its next destination. Suddenly, a warning light began flashing, indicating that the sonar system had powered up and had detected a target. The crew member panicked as he hadn't touched any of the sonar equipment, so started to shout down into the living quarters for assistance. After a few minutes, Skipper John Hilton came up on deck asking what was wrong. His colleague explained what had happened and swore that he hadn't touched the sonar system. It had turned on by itself. Tired and annoyed, John told his crewman that he'd obviously clipped the switch with his leg while he was sitting down, and to go down below deck and get some rest, and he would finish off the watch. John switched the sonar off and after a while went down to the engine room to check the electrical switchboard because of another small issue, but was completely taken aback when he saw that the sonar system's power supply wasn't even connected. So how had he and his crewmen been looking at the sonar readout screen if the system didn't even have power? Paranormal activity began to ramp up in the weeks and months following this incident, with both the skipper and his crew experiencing many aspects of a classic haunting. Clouds of oppressive, dark and depressing emotions would sweep over the Pickering, affecting the crew's ability to work as a cohesive team and, at times, raising tensions when things weren't going right. Being miles out at sea for days on end gave the spirit on the boat plenty of time to really get inside the minds of the skipper and his crew. Lee Utting was a deckhand who was part of the crew under John Hilton, and he described firsthand how difficult it was. Quote, Everything we did, he did with us. It was his ship, the ghost, and he couldn't accept us being on it. The trawler was controlled by him, and he could have sank us if he really wanted to. It really was terrifying, and you didn't know if you were going to come home because it's a bad life out here anyway, especially when you've got something like that around with you. End quote. Skipper John Hilton was quoted as saying, quote, You can feel when there's something bad aboard a ship. When you've been at sea for a long time, you can just feel it. End quote. And it was John who was about to experience another disturbing encounter. The Pickering had made it back to land after a trip out, and the crew had cleaned up and made the ship secure. John was the last person to step off the deck and onto the harbour when he heard a loud banging noise coming from deep inside the ship. He slowly turned around and stepped back on board, taking a long pause to try and make out where the banging noise could be coming from. Had something been left on? He was positive that not only the crew but he himself had checked everything before shutting down the ship. John described the noise like a hammer hitting a metal pipe, 
and not something like a pipe cooling down. He made his way inside and deeper down into the bowels of the pickering. As he switched the lights on to illuminate the dark spaces, they began to flicker. John quickly switched the lights back off and made his way back up onto the deck of the ship. He locked up and left, not knowing who or what was making the noise. After around two years of ownership of the vessel, nothing was going right at all, and everyone on board felt that not only the ship was haunted and cursed, but also every trip out to sea. The trawler would never fish properly, and electrical and mechanical issues were causing so many problems that the ship would never stay out at sea for long enough to complete a full trip. No matter how much money, time and effort was spent on trying to correct problems, issues and breakdowns, the Pickering had finally driven its skipper and crew to the point of giving up. Not long after, the tough decision was made by John Hilton and his crew to throw in the towel and to finally move on. As for the Pickering, it was scrapped, with deckhand Liutting commenting, quote, it was the best thing for it because she was a danger to be at sea, so it was the best thing for it to be scrapped, end quote. Maybe he was right. If the Pickering was truly haunted, then why put another potential crew through the same misery? If the spirit was indeed the man who was lost at sea, then his connection to the ship must have been so incredibly strong that no exorcism would have truly removed him. In many documented cases of hauntings, when an exorcism is performed, it tends to make the situation worse. It appears that this was exactly the case that had cursed the Pickering for so many years. But similar to Borley Rectory, its destruction will surely stop any further instances of paranormal activity. Unless parts of the ship have made their way onto other vessels, and they've carried something with them. So picture yourself on holiday in Cornwall, maybe Nuki to be exact, and you've made your way down to the harbour on a beautiful sunny day, and you've spontaneously decided to take a trip out on one of the pleasure boats. Whilst you're sitting there enjoying the views and the clear blue sea, just make sure you keep an eye on the people on board with you, because the next person who could see a ghost out at sea could be you. Well, we've come to the end of this episode of the Haunted UK podcast. But before I go, I'd like to give a few shout-outs. And the first one is to all of you, the listeners. Thank you so much for following, subscribing and listening. None of this would be possible without all of you. The show is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts and Radio Public. Wherever possible, leaving a positive five-star review helps the show in many ways. Listener figures are rapidly rising, and that's all down to you. So a huge thanks to all of you. Another shout-out goes to the show's sponsor, CDS Print and Design, who have been kind enough to come back for a second season. Huge thanks again to both Colin and Debbie. Next up is another request to all you listeners out there. Have you seen a ghost? Witnessed poltergeist activity? Had a strange, unexplained paranormal experience? Have you ever stayed in a haunted location or experienced something frightening on a ghost tour? Even better, do you live or work in a haunted house or building? Have you encountered or seen a UFO? Heard a story about an unsolved disappearance or mystery? Or have you been lucky enough to witness a strange, unknown creature? If you have, then your story could feature on our Listener Stories finale episode. Simply type your story up and email it to hauntedukpodcast at hotmail.com. That's hauntedukpodcast at hotmail.com. It's easy to do, and if you like, you can remain anonymous. Huge thanks in advance to you all. Besides writing, recording, mixing and mastering this podcast, I also run a mixing and mastering studio called Pink Flamingo Music Productions. 
If you have a podcast or piece of music that you'd like mixing, mastering, or both, or if you'd like a piece of finished music written for a project that you're working on, then please email the studio with details of your inquiry to pinkflamingo.musicproductions at hotmail.com. That's pinkflamingo.musicproductions at hotmail.com. It's nowhere near as expensive as you'd think. This podcast was recorded at Pink Flamingo Music Production Studio in Hales Owen in the West Midlands, England. For a full list of research sources that helped immensely with the content of this episode, please refer to the show's notes. Thank you all so much again for listening, and we'll be back very soon with another episode. Until then, stay safe and take care.